Hello, thank you for joining us for Star Seed Disclosure Project. I'm Unicole Unicron. I'm Jeremy Gatto. And today we're here with Aurora. Hello, Aurora. Hello, thank you. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, if you guys haven't seen it, I did an interview with Aurora on my Unicole Unicron channel. And so if you like what you see here, check that interview out. Um, we'll probably cover a little bit different stuff than we covered in that interview. Um, so it's just such an honor to talk to you again, Aurora. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for asking me to participate and share my ideas and my, my experiences here with everyone. Um, so our first question is, are, do you identify as a starseed? Um, I would say as a non-terrestrial being, like, I don't know exactly the definition of starseed because it's more the idea of like, you were planted here a long time ago and have been kind of like dormant. I think the term that works best for describing my experience is walk-in, even though I didn't invent that. And there are some aspects of it that don't fit exactly in terms of my experience, but that is how I usually describe myself, that I'm a galactic walk-in and that I'm a non-terrestrial presence that in adulthood came into the physical body of a person that was an Earth personality for the first 27 years of, of life here. So um, can you give the viewers who maybe haven't heard exactly that, just a brief rundown of, of what that looked like for you and from your experience? Yeah, so that, it was a very sudden experience. It wasn't a gradual thing at all for me. It happened very suddenly on October 8th of 2001, and it was precipitated by the physical death, like the metabolic death of the previous occupant of this body. So I've read subsequently that some walk-ins, like they don't know that they've walked in, they're confused, or it happens after surgery or whatever like that. For me, it was a very clear delineated event that there was a different person that lived in this body. She went through what was like you could call it a psychic attack it was a directed energy weapon that harmed her brain and her energy centers and her mind and it also caused an anoxic brain injury so that's like the brain injury that you get where there's not enough oxygen in your blood vessels in your brain and you know it causes neurological damage so that's what caused the previous personality that was in this body to not be able to be in this body anymore. And I, the person that's speaking now, I'm usually an abstraction in the sense like, I'm not, I don't usually have a face and two arms and two legs. I'm usually more like one of these paintings that I make back here, uh, a collection of sound and light and polygons that moves. And that's, that's like what my, my, my origins, my, my stellar origins. That's what it was like for me. And I came into this body by changing the genetic structure using an, a maneuver that I invented and that I call the flying rainbow lasagna. So this is why I share my backstory with people. It's kind of a personal experience and it's, it was traumatic and difficult to get through it. It can, it can be hard to describe, but I describe it to people because it's more than just what happened to me. It's what created the events that allowed me to create the flying rainbow lasagna. And this new shape of my genes allowed me to not die, first of all, like that was a big one, that the organic cells of this body, instead of dying, got to have a new format. And it's not just a new format for me, everybody has the opportunity to vibrate like a flying rainbow lasagna <laughs> and change your cell cellular structure, redefine death, and also redefine the experience of being here. Cause it's not just like, you know, I'm not just a vegetable lying in bed. Clearly I walk, I talk, I do artwork. So this was like a transformation on every level. And it's not just for me, it's something that's available that now this is um, a new tool that every one of us can use to rearrange our genes. And so I, I bring forward like my personal experience to say like as a template, I survived what would have killed me and I have um, you know, transcended the limitations and we can all do this. We can all, that's the positive message. We can all do something like this, something similar. That's amazing. Um, so that was probably a lot for people who haven't uh, heard about these things before. My question is um, kind of, you were saying that there was like a, a weapon used against the previous occupant of the body. And well, I and probably other, you know, conspiracy theorists might understand that from that perspective, what did that look like to what would that what did that look like to people who don't understand in that way? What what would be like if if it was reported, you know, like from to the general public, like what what happened? What an excellent question. To the outside observer, it would have just looked like the person that used to be in this body lay down on the couch for a nap and maybe had some kind of a stroke or an episode or 
uh, a, a, like a biological event that paralyzed them on the couch and they were unable to get up for like, let's say 18 hours. And that if, if the flying rainbow lasagna hadn't happened, that simply would have been the corporeal death of this body. And they would have found the body on the couch and had a funeral. But because I came into this body as an abstraction and did this flying rainbow lasagna maneuver with the genes, at a certain point, I was able to get up off the couch. And I knew that I was in a different realm. I mean, there was no question. Although, like I said, some walk-ins, like they're confused at first and they don't know where they are, or what's going on. So like there was a lot of neurological disruption in the brain, like that caused this person to die. So when I first got up off the couch, I did not have my math skills. All of the math skills had been obliterated. So like if I looked at a number three and a number eight, they didn't look like anything to me. They just looked like hieroglyphics. So it's been a very long, I bring that forward because it's a very long journey for me to go from being totally numerically illiterate to being able to understand math on the profound level that I now do. So I didn't have math skills. I clearly didn't understand addition and subtraction and money. And I also was not articulate like I am now with words. Like if you ask me now, what happened? I lay down on the couch and there was this problem. I can describe it to you. But many years ago, I was not articulate like this. So uh, one of the problems that I had was aphasia, like the inability to choose the right word that I wanted to choose and express myself, you know, in a linear fashion. So I like you can, when I first got up off the couch, no, I didn't go to a hospital and I ended up contacting, you know, family members and they talked, they came and talked to me and I told them everything about what had happened, that I had died, I had gone through hell, I had come through heaven and I was back here on earth and they just like kind of like condescended to me like they're there dear like everything is okay like they didn't really think that anything had happened so it wasn't until like many months went by and they began to see that there were profound personality changes I changed my name I changed my artwork and clearly I also I didn't have the same communication math skills that I had before but it took a long time for the people that were around me in my life to see like something is different and is going on here and that was a, a large part of me, Aurora, like my challenge, it was um, establishing my own identity and that I'm not insane. Like there's, I'm not a damaged insane person, but that I'm a valid person. And it's also like having a twin. You're like, you're always being mixed up with your twin. Like, you know, whatever, if your twin is named Sally or Joan or whatever, it's like, no, 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 that's Sally, that's Joan, that's not me. So I was constantly being mixed up with the person who used to have this face and used to be in this body. I spent a long time in the first couple of years just establishing like, this is who Aurora is. These are, this is my body. These are my thoughts, my desires and my dreams and requiring that the people around me respected the change because that was a big, like they couldn't accept it that that had happened. Of course not. I mean, that would be extremely difficult for you just to be a completely different person and come getting mixed up with the, this other person who wasn't you. And then also it must have been extremely difficult on them. They probably really wanted to push that person onto you saying, no, you're wrong because of all of their past experience. So I'm sure that other walk-ins will have this issue as well. Um, have you been able to resolve that with your, your, you know, your body's family, you know, and, and how, how does that, how did that look and how does it look now? It was a huge challenge. And so I feel like I would love to be a mentor or guide or helper for anyone who's a walk-in who's like really new because I've been here for about 16 years. And um, integrating with the biological family of this body was really challenging because I changed my name. I changed my religious description of because when I had the experience of walking in and of death, I had an experience with Christ consciousness and that was really profound. And I wear a cross, not because I'm a member of the Christian church or any of the dogma on earth but because I really had that experience and when I shared that with the family members of this you know the body that I'm connected to here like they thought that I was personally insulting to them so I and I changed my name I changed my religion I changed so many aspects of my personality and I think that that was at a certain point what made it evident to the people like the observers around me like this is really not the same person but it, it took a long time for that you know, to, and they, the, the challenge at first was that the family felt very like personally rejected because I wasn't at being who they wanted me to be. And so it's been a long journey. Like it took more than a decade to get to the levels of acceptance. I really had to build a bridge. So that's why I'd say I'd like to like men, be a guide, be a mentor to say like, don't just totally cut off 
interactions with the family that you were connected to or that you have that body from now, but that build, like keep the door open, build a bridge because that family over 16 years, they've grown and they've um, changed their mentation and what they can even conceive of. So I was, I used to be personally insulted that they looked at me as if I was insane, that they couldn't see, like, not only am I sane, I'm highly organized, like insane people don't make a painting like this, like this, that I've got information to share, but I, I understand like it's, it's been a real, uh, like a challenge of love and acceptance. Can I accept other people and their limitations and can they accept me and what I am? So where I am now with the biological family, like we're in a good place. We, we talk on the phone, they respect my journey. They celebrate who I am and want me to have, you know, good things and good art opportunities and everything. And I respect them that they are, you know, part of the, they're like out, they have like a very parochial and limited view that's based in earth culture and that that is who they are. Like I don't, they're, they're not, they're not very cosmic. They're very mundane. They're very down to earth. And the idea of having a, an extraterrestrial walk in, in the body of their daughter is way more than what they way outside of their, their comfort level there. But the, it's, it's a challenge of love. Like, it's like, if you are adopted into a family that's very very different than what you are and you try to be your true self never compromise who you really are um but you got to love and accept people on the level that they're at and and then you know also find your tribe like i found my tribe and people who were very accepting of uh, being a walk-in being extraterrestrial being unusual having a different mental pattern like you got to find the people that celebrate you for who you are and don't try to fit you into a box of their expectations that's amazing. And yeah, it sounds like a, an intense challenge. <laughs> yeah, you answered the exact questions that I was wondering about your family and everything, because that's obviously something that everybody would wonder when you suddenly transform and change like that. And um, I was I was wondering as far as like um, when you say that you came from an abstraction, um, does that sort of previous place where you were at, is that is that like a... Um, a location to you like is is that is there actually a location there or is it more like like do you are you aware of it being associated with certain planets or something like that or is it just like another dimension for you this is an awesome question because when i used to tell people like i'm an extraterrestrial walk and they jokingly would ask me like where's planet aurora like where are you from like mm -hmm. it, like it's a point that i could point to in the night sky and it, that's, it, it also, it took me many years to have an answer because there was so much um, disruption of my memories coming in here. But the best I can say is that I come from a collective that is like a values system. I, it's like advanced jazz band. So we mm -hmm. don't, come, don't come from a particular place because we come from all over. So there's different um, members of the jazz band that come from all sorts of different places. And we all had to audition to get into the band. That means you've achieved certain levels of unconditional love and acceptance and inner refinement because part of being a good musician is that you listen to the other musicians. You're not always like on your own beat or, or soloing on your own project. So I like to tell people I come from a collective of consciousnesses and it has a value system. And the value system is based in unconditional love and in freedom for everyone. And this is also, when I first got here and I would tell people, oh, like I come from a hive mind, they'd be like, ew, a hive mind, like you're a horrible person, get away from me. So I had to learn these are not the right words to describe my experience. It's coming, I come from a family of consciousness. In this time and place, the word family denotes like I care about you and you care about me and our fates are intertwined and we share resources. That is the type of consciousness collective that I come from. So it's not like joining the Borg where you become an automaton and you lose your individuality and someone else tells you what to do. It's not like that at all. It's exactly like being in a jazz band. When Herbie Hancock was gonna play, uh, play piano for um, in uh, Miles Davis's band, he asked Miles Davis, his, his, his idol, he's like, what should I play? And Miles Davis said, you should play your piano. Like, I'm not gonna tell you what to play, you tell yourself what to play. That's the level of consciousness that I come from, that we are all um, very highly refined, very loving um, musicians in the cosmic symphony. And we have our own innate divine connection like that tells you play this note, do this thing, do this thing. And then we all harmonically integrate with one another in this giant symphony. So what it looks like to the observer, it looks like a polygon, uh, a multi-sided um, uh, collection of you know shapes and colors that's moving 
and that emits sounds. And what we do is we go from star system to star system, having experiences and getting emotional energy. Like that's the gas that makes our vehicle go. And the emotional energy is, is about unconditional love. Like we come here into the world. Oh, I love your cat. Oh my God. <laughs> it's interrupting. <laughs> love, love, love. Oh my God, you're coming over to me. I love you so much. Who's your beautiful fur person there? That, who's your boss? Who's your boss's name? This is Meatball. Oh, Meatball, that's, thank you. Your, your furry overlord came in to supervise and make sure. Yeah. <laughs> this is unconditional love. And so it is the idea of, um, unconditional love means a sharing of energy. Like I throw a ball to you and you throw the ball back to me or like trapeze, like I swing over here and touch this person and this person swings over here and touches this person. And that's what our collective is like. So we have experiences submerged in reality, get raw materials and then go off in the next direction. And all of this is about consensual like this is not rape or going across boundaries in, not in any way like i had to tell people that i came from a different type of hive mind than they were imagining because you imagine hive mind like fascist totalitarian state you imagine like the borg taking away your or some communist dictatorship taking away your individuality and forcing you to conform to certain things and it's not like that at all so i had to say like the hive mind is different than that and the way that we share resources is different than the way that people share resources here because it's like in my body, my earlobe doesn't take all of the energy away from my heart cells like they share. And in my, my non-terrestrial collective, we all share energy. Like the idea of one aspect of our collective dying and starving while the rest of us are fat and happy is totally unimaginable. So these are the things that I didn't get when I came here to planet Earth and this cultural, economic, and social context. I didn't understand why people didn't share their resources with one another. Like I literally remember walking around and wondering why everyone here treated God so shabbily because God is that sharing. God is that spark. God is that, you know, what, what we do when we are together. And I couldn't understand that this, at first, that this is a place that is based completely on competition and the idea of severe individuality at the expense of other people. And so I've, I had to learn, like, if you're, if you're totally going on the collective, but you're here submerged in this time place, at a certain point, you're going to learn, like, you're not going to have any resources. So then you have to learn why, why I, I had to restructure my entire value system of how what how you how you share energy with others. So now what I try to do is I tell other people about what it's like where I come from and the idea that, that it would it's unconscionable and unimaginable that you would have a social or economic system set up where some people specifically don't have what they need and everyone knows about it. Like, yeah, there's that guy sleeping on the street and we know about it and we leave him there like that. <laughs> is unimaginable. So mm -hmm. I try to tell people what it's like from, from, um, from my perspective and from my point of view. And this also has to do with like artistic collaboration. So, I mean, mostly, um, I, first I'll throw it out there. I would love to collaborate both artistically, visually and musically with other people. And it's hard to find that in this time and place because even artists and creative people are trained for like out and out competition. It's all about cutthroat competition and artists are fighting because it's like, you're going to get in that gallery, but I want to get in that gallery. So I'm going to fight against you and try to tear you down. And I didn't understand that when I first came here. I'm like, how come all these artists aren't working together and building each other up and creating a giant community? So that I, I understood after a certain point, like, okay, I'm here in this place where everybody does it. And at first, when I came here also, I had to be like, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. Like at first I had to integrate into this world. And I was like, I didn't know how to do a lot of things. And I would be like, okay, I'm just going to observe how people do it. And then I will follow along with them. So at first I did all the things that were, you know, social things that are acceptable, but that are not loving and also biological things. Like I um, ate sugar and drank caffeine and smoked tobacco and did all the things that people in this time and place do because that is the normal thing to do. And then I had to learn like, these substances are not right for the human body at all. Like this is not the right way to treat a person at all. And after I learned like, okay, just because they do it here in this way does not make it right. Then I started to learn like, wait a minute, 
I should actually be telling them about where I come from and the way we do it where I'm in my place and start teaching them about this. So that it has been um, like within the past 10 years, the way that I have uh, started doing it, telling people about what it's like from my collective and trying to gather my tribe here of people who would like to drop the competition, drop that whole capitalistic value system and get into economic and social and creative collaboration. That's beautiful. Um, let's see, it's camera's focused. out of focus. I know, oh. it was from the cat came up. I know, the cat did it, it's funny. <laughs> okay, so my, I have a question that's totally unrelated and it's um, that you're talking about making sound in this higher place. Okay, first off, I wanna, this is just a two part question and they have nothing to do with each other. So generally I think of like, um, you know, like like higher level beings, like Pleiadians, Arcturians, like you described them in our last conversation, like those beings that use technology, and then, um, you know, like some other beings which are, you know, lower use technology as well, and obviously humans do. And then, um, and then I see sort of um, ascended masters, and you know, like this is like a, a value system that really, you know, doesn't need to exist, but as far as like the levels of closeness to source, we could say. So we've got technology users, then we've got ascended masters, and then like angels, like where would you say that your collective of like would be fitting into that or is it beyond that or is it outside of that really good i should have mentioned that i would say it's at the level of like ascended masters that my collective does not use technology in order to travel through space you know i like to say this is how experts do star travel it is not in a clank clank metal spaceship it is not like, you know, you get into your car and your car is an inanimate object and it drives you to where you wish to go. So our vessel that we use to go from place to place, first of all, we use the stellar network, the sun and the stars. Those are all connected to our energy centers and that is the apparatus for transferring consciousness. Like you don't need a car and it's not something inert that you get inside of, it's a living being. So the time field, this, you know, this living, structured, three-dimensional moving embroidery, that is what we get inside of. And it's not like getting on board, it's not like, you know, getting into a car, it's more like love making. So in order to get on board one of these vessels for transferring of consciousness, your feelings have to be right. Your genes have to be dancing in the right way. It's like making love. How do you make love to someone? Well, you don't just rape them. You don't just grab them by their hair and drag them back to your, your uh, cave and force them to do it. You have to have conversations. You have to learn about them. They have to love you. They have to allow you entry. That is how you get on board one of our vehicles for transfer. You have to begin to transform your genes and your consciousness and how you live your life and how you ap approach your, your daily existence in order to integrate that and be on board. And then once, once you are on board, you are like a part of the metabolism. Like the cells in my body are part of the metabolism of this body and I carry my cells around with me where I go. Our structure of consciousness fits together in this floating ball of consciousness and it moves on the stellar network going going to the next place and i'll even tell you this the there is um a, a greater being than just us determining where we go it's like being a musician in a symphony and there is a great conductor that's like tap 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 now it's time for you to do this now it's time for you to do this so we're not just self-indulgently you know jamming on our own like whatever sounds good and whatever we want to do we're doing that but we're also jamming within this larger context that it's a it's a metabolism of a larger being and we are like one cell moving around this metabolism of a larger being and when all of this is right when all of when we get rid of all of the distortions all of that technology basically technology is used as a compensatory mode that um beings that can't they're not in the jazz band they don't have the unamplified psychic powers to be able to do this work without technology. So I'm telling every human being that's on earth right now, like as long as you haven't been cloned or, you know, like in some other way, like polluted with transhumanism, you have everything that you need to do this journey. You don't need any microchips or elixirs or like a fancy magic wand or crystals or anything like that. All you need is your physical body and you learn and change and grow. And, and also you don't do it as an individual, like not just like a lone person flying through space. That's a big thing is that it's a community. It's an ecosystem, just like the way that in, in the e ecological world, you have plants and you also have microbes and you also have minerals and you also have insects and they're all working together. So transferring consciousness in this vessel from star system to star system involves um, specialization 
like there's plants and animals and insects and microbes. So not everybody in the collective performs the same exact functions. People have different functions. Like in the symphony, there's the deep kettle drum and the high piccolo and everyone in between. And everybody basically fits together and performs their, their job like uh, cells in a larger metabolism. The technology users are not that, the beings that I come from. And there's different levels of technology users. There's purely malevolent ones, like in the you know, in the extraterrestrial societies, there are very powerful but very malevolent users of technology. And they've totally enslaved humanity and other, uh, you know, other planets. They've, they, you know, they've gone from planet to planet, like pretty much like a mining company, you like plop, plopping themselves down, taking whatever is valuable, refining it out, and then destroying everything and going on to the next place. That's totally different than my collective. Like I have to keep on you know, making a distinction. I'm not a body snatcher. I came into this body consensually, but there are technological body snatchers that do uh, lobotomize physical humans and then install their own harmful operating system. Like that really does happen. And I had to learn when I would introduce myself as a lock-in that some people would think like, don't trust her. She's a body snatcher. I had to learn like, ooh, like there's horrible people that do that. So then I had to distinguish myself. No, I'm not like that at all. I'm like this. So yeah, when I tell people about interacting with non-terrestrial beings, um, go for the values. Like what values do, does that being promote? Choose non-technological and ask them where their energy comes from. Like if someone flies in a big spaceship and hovers over your house and says, come come aboard with me. You could be like, okay, cool. But first tell me, what is the gas that makes your vehicle go? And if they answer honestly, and if they say, oh, it's raping and murdering children on earth, then you could be like, no, I don't want to go on board that. that <laughs> because that's what you're going to find out. Most of these space races that use technology where they are getting their technology from first of all it is uh handed down it's not something that they created themselves like they inherited it they didn't invent it and the the price that you pay is that you somewhere along the line had to rape or murder or diminish the consciousness of someone else and that's it's the hijacking and distortion of dna that is used in technology to distort the time field and once you find out about that it would be like a yanomami indian from the Brazilian Amazon basin who had never seen a car, never seen electricity. And imagine if you took them and just put them in Times Square and you didn't tell them where that electricity comes from. They'd be like, wow, lights, magic, cars, look at all of this. But then if you showed them, well, we have to strip mine this in order to make these LED lights and we have to destroy the environment in this way to get this petroleum. We have to do this. Then that tribes person would be much less unduly impressed by the levels of technology because you pay a price. So if I'm an extraterrestrial, I use technology and I fly in with my giant, you know, spaceship and I say, hi, I'm a god, worship me. Ask, hey, how did you get that spaceship? Where did it come from? Did you make it yourself? What makes it run? And if the answer is not, oh, we run on pure unconditional love and we're connected to the stellar network, then that's not a group that you wish to be a part of because they're all basically all of the, um, uh, satanic ritual abuse. And when I say satanic, I'm not just referring to something out of the Bible and biblical literalism and earth religion. I'm actually referring to a race of technology using extraterrestrials. They are satanic. They use technology that is made from rape and murder and they distort the time field and it allows them to be temporarily augmented. Like uh, they get, you know, temporary power in order to do that, but there's always a price to pay and they're not really the most powerful beings at the pinnacle of the pyramid. The most powerful beings at the pinnacle of the pyramid don't use technology and they're also, they're not egotistical. So they won't come around to be like, we're the most powerful and we're gonna screw you up and do whatever we want. Like they're not, they're not like that. You might not even see them because they're busy being good musicians in the band and only playing the notes that they're supposed to play. Wow. So is, is this the reason why a lot of people that say they see light ships in the sky and things like that, uh, a lot of them say that they can, by putting out waves of love and looking up at the sky, these uh, light ships can appear. Um, they just sort of appear out of nowhere. And so a lot of people, you know, if they're looking at it from a purely physical perspective, they're saying, well, these ships have just, they must be really fast because they've just like appeared here out of nowhere because they're thinking in this physical way. But is it more because they're not necessarily actually in a physical item so much, but it's more of a type of consciousness that's being uh, summoned by that love because you're saying that they're not necessarily traveling in a ship as such, but more of a like form of love in a way. Is that? Yeah, I would say 
beings who do not use technology, if you telepathically called them and said, hey, I'd love to have a visitation, they are more like coming through an interdimensional portal. But mm -hmm. beings that use what I would call like clank, clank metal technology, they are also telepathic, but they use technology to be telepathic. So let's say the di di distinction would be like you and I, we can be psychic just using pure unconditional love and we form a bridge of love from my mind to your mind. But let's say I'm not a loving being. I'm like the most evil, horrible, demonic being that's possible. But let's say I can create a microchip in my brain and I can use that microchip to amplify or augment what would be my loving psychic powers. And I can use that in order to um, artificially go across your boundaries and mind rape you and go into your mind. Yeah, I want to have another like whole long conversation <laughs> with you about technology because I too. I think that your ideas about it are really awesome and like interesting and different than mine and I, I think we could have a good conversation. Um, for this video, you guys look for that because I think that would be a really fun video. Um, but for this conversation, um, well actually to go back to my question that doesn't relate yet. Uh, Sound in other dimensions. So I've been trying to get to the bottom of this for a while now because sound is this, um, you know, it's 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 not on the electromagnetic spectrum because it needs a medium to pass through. So how can music and sound exist in these higher dimensions where there's not an atmosphere of air, Aurora? <laughs> okay. If we define music according to harmonics and we say music is organized sound waves. I got my little electric piano over here. We call that a chord, we say this is organized sound waves. And what that means is, here's like a little picture of one of my, you know, um, harmonic structures of our non-physical energy centers. This is the visual representation of music. Music means organized waves. So those waves can be auditory, like we're hearing it and with the little tiny vibrating ears of our cochlea, they can be visual, we're seeing it with our eyes or we can experience them as organized time waves. Anything that is a wave, we can experience as music. So it, we can have the, the medium through which the music is expressed doesn't have to be the atmosphere of air, it can be the atmosphere of time. We can vibrate the time field as music. And I would say that's the goal that we want to do. We're in this musical, um, beautiful symphony. And when, Here's another, we can use the strings of our DNA as the medium through which to vibrate music because we all have in the nuclei of our cells these wonderful vibrating strings and we affect others with our vibration and we are affected by others with our vibration. And that's not just humanity, it's also domesticated cats and microbes and yeasts and redwoods, I'm pointing to the trees outside. It's anything that has genetics is in the symphony and we're all playing this music. So it can be in time, it can also be in DNA. That's beautiful. Um, did you have another? Um, no, I was, yeah, I, I was pretty fascinated by what you're saying just earlier on the creatures taking over people's minds um, and things like that, because I had experienced uh, in 2014, these sort of spirit or extraterrestrial beings um, speaking to me while I was in a mid sleep state kind of panning around my head. And they were just saying that there were these warlike creatures trying to take over their minds. And, and I kind of got this, uh, I got, I got a kind of glimpse into what it is that you're talking about with, with all of these like lobotomies and body snatcher things and everything like that. So uh, I can definitely relate to a lot of that. And I, um, I don't really have a question based on that, but I just, I've also noticed in the way that you're in the way that you speak because of where you come from, that you're very, you're so tapped into consciousness that you're so telepathic all the time. And it's something just as an observation that I hadn't noticed when I saw your original interview with Unicol, because from an observer's point of view, when you're seeing you speaking, you don't necessarily understand that there's actually a conversation going on through thoughts. And so people might think, oh, well, you talk a lot, but actually what's happening is there's this constant conversation because I'll be thinking a question and then you're just answering. I'll be like, okay, I don't need to ask that anymore. And then she's doing the same. Yeah. And, and then there's um, there's like a lot of things you've referenced in your conversation, which we've talked about today. Or we saw or, Redwood or today. We, we talked about it. We talked it. about when in Rome. Do we said when in Rome. Yeah, like all these things you're saying. Like there's and, obviously a telepathic connection that's happening. And right. And and I think that that you're 
you're you come from a place where that's all part of this flow and this channel because you're you're one and part of this whole consciousness and that's a really beautiful thing to see so it's almost like watching a watching a movie just sort of play out and and we don't even necessarily have to speak because it's all really a conversation and that's not something a viewer can see so I just thought I would like put that out Thank there so you. that other people are aware of what's going on it's pretty yeah, amazing I I'm so happy that you described that because that's also more of like the way that my collective functions, not through the laborious flapping of the moving right. out parts, but through just in, in, that real immediacy. And it's not the first time that I've had this experience. I was on another uh, radio show where they had a chat room, but I couldn't see who was writing in the chat room, but there were questions coming in there and I kept just answering the questions that were coming into the chat room before the host could even read them in. And to me, that's just all normal. It's because we are all musicians in a symphony. We are all connected telepathically. Pathically, we're connected biologically. Our genes all affect one another. And of course, we're here in this context. So it just makes like, oh, of course, that just makes perfect sense. Of course, we are all going to be connected underneath the surface, not just here in the mundane above the surface. And I'm telling you, these connections will become even more evident as we begin to become more refined, like birth of a new dimension. This really means that we are coming forward into the world World where the narrative fiction that we are separate totally is uh, you know taken away because the truth we are we are one we are part of this giant mycelial network known as humanity so what's going on in your mind affects my mind and my mind affects your mind and then we have to get into interdimensional ethics just like if we're in the room together and if I'm like tapping my pen and it really annoys you it's like a war stop that you're really annoying if we are connected on our minds and I'm doing the equivalent in my mind you have to be like a war stop doing that because you're really annoying me with your mind so we have to you know find a way to be respectful in the realm of pure consciousness and telepathy and mind. That's amazing. So obviously, Aurora, if you guys are watching, you know that she has a lot to teach. Um, where can they find your teachings and how can they learn more about you and what you're about and, and what, you're, what you're bringing to this realm? Thank you so much for asking. Yeah, the best way to find out about me or connect with me is go to flyingrainbowlasagna.com. And it's lasagna spelled with an E on the end, L-A-S-A-G-N-E. And there you can connect easily to my artwork. You can connect to my YouTube channel, which is Channel Flying Rainbow Lasagna. Connect with me on Facebook and Twitter. And the, the I do a series of recorded lessons called Lessons for Full Spectrum Humans. And it allows me to laboriously, with the flapping of my moving mouth parts, describe all of these concepts. And the I, we, we do an interactive webinar each month along with the lessons. And the idea is that we are collaborating as artists. We're sharing our ideas. I'm sending out ideas to you. You're reflecting ideas back to me. It's not just a unidirectional me sending out energy it's all about collaboration and symphony like if 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 you're getting an idea of who are the extraterrestrials that aurora is connected to it's the beings that want collaboration we want um mutual respect and you know love meaning unconditional love this is the dance party like we all want to be i, I tell people i don't just want to be like a garage band player playing in my own garage with no one else around no i want to be jamming with all of these wonderful musicians that are here on the planet people like you and redwood trees and microbes and butterflies and uh, yes, we have the capacity to create this um, um, collaborative artwork into something that is really amazing. Like right now, it's rather uncomfortable. We're, we're, it, the painting is going through a difficult stage, but it can turn into something really beautiful if we keep working on it. Lessons for Full Spectrum Humans is incredible stuff. Um, it's it's almost um, it's at the level where like I watch one of the videos and then have to take a nap to like process it. It's like really high level, awesome information. And so I, I recommend that class um, personally to you guys. Um, check that out. And um, my last question, Aurora, is um, have you ever had any experiences on earth like um, of connecting? I know that you have guides that you channel, but um, do you ever have any experiences where you physically connect with any beings or have you ever like I w abduction is the wrong word but like you know willingly go on into like a love spaceship like does that happen to you or is that just something that you had experienced and now you're here on earth and like there's been no contact 
physically or otherwise. No, of course, I'm totally still connected to my collective while I'm here, even though I, I'm, I, I'm in the same boat as all of you. The genetic degradation of this physical container makes it much harder to hear them. But yeah, we are totally connected. And the best way I can describe my experiences when I've been here is that they require a bridge of love, like a conduit of love. So it has happened to me through plants, like through a beautiful field of grass, and also through a particular cactus that used to grow on my windowsill. It's like that was the little antenna through which my collective um, you know, came into the material world and spoke to me through there. So that's, it, it's like, um, it's all about living beings. It is not about dead inert technology. So I am able to connect with them very well when like I go to um, a place that is not polluted by technology, like there's no EMFs and Wi-Fi and all of that and surrounded by a lot of trees and surrounded by a lot of the, the living natural world, like that is the best antenna for them to be able to speak to me and contact me. Wow, <laughs> this is no, this is deep stuff. I would, I, I could talk to you for twelve hours. <laughs> I would love that. <laughs> we might have to come visit you sometime yeah. because I have a lot of questions. Yeah, <laughs> you are welcome to come and visit. Come sleep on my couch, or we'll go for a walk in the woods in the redwoods yeah. together. That would be so magical. So, um, if you are watching this, viewers, if you have a story that you want to share on Star Seed Disclosure Project, let us know. They're released every Tuesday. And thank you so much, Aurora, for talking with us. It's an honor, as always, such an amazing time. Thank you for inviting me, and thank you for your, your friendship and for your inspiration and for sharing these ideas as widely as possible as we are all becoming musicians in this wonderful symphony playing together. Thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs>